Hi everybody, it's me, Rye Crafty. I'm back with another video, and also, small co-host is asleep on my lap. So, I have a sewing project to show you. It's finished. It was half finished for a long time, and having it sitting there on my sewing table staring at me sort of stopped me sewing anything else, because I knew I really wanted the finished thing, but I did not want to finish it, because <laughs> I was at a really fiddly step. And so I just left it for a while, and yes, hello. And then that meant I had nothing really to show you, so I didn't really do any videos. And also, this, I mean, the lack of videos is mostly me, but I also want to blame Neil Gaiman. <laughs> because at the end of July, season two of Good Omens uh, was released on Amazon Prime, and I'd watched the first series of Good Omens uh, when it came out in 2019. I read the book years and years ago. I have a signed copy I'm very proud of. <laughs> and yeah, when I watched it in 2019, I thought, this is great. This is so fun. I love David Tennant. Love Michael Sheen. Great show. And then this year, so many years later, uh, season two came out and I didn't watch it right on the release weekend, but pretty soon after. But about a couple weeks later, I thought, oh, I'll rewatch season one to remind myself uh, where we left our angel and our demon. And then I'll watch season two. And watching rewatching season one was lots of fun. And then season two was amazing. But then the ending, like season two just makes you feel so happy. And then the ending stabs you in the heart. <laughs> and I was useless for a long time, like in the evenings, because like I rewatched, I rewatched it because there's always in the there's always little hints and things that you miss and so I wanted to watch it a second time. It's only six episodes. And then I started reading about the fan theories and what's gonna happen and clues that we've been left that you might not have noticed and like my evenings were taken up with the study <laughs> of what happened in Good Omen season two. So between that and the fiddly collar on my Carolyn pajamas, I didn't sew anything for a while. That and it's hot and sometimes I just want to lie on the couch and not do anything, because doing anything makes it too hot. So today, as I said, I finished this today, I, my wonderful Carolyn pajamas. I have just realized it's Labor Day weekend. That's not what I just realized. I knew that. It's Labor Day weekend. I live in Toronto, which means the Canadian National Exhibition is on, which is like a big fun fair and all those rides and like fair games and fried food and all that stuff. Also, on the last weekend, which is always Labor Day weekend, there's an air show. And so there's like military jets flying over. <laughs> I'm nowhere near the park where all this is happening. But I'm on the path between the airport where these things are launching <laughs> and... Oh, here we go. So yeah, I'm in between the airport and where they go to do their loop-de-loops. Or whatever they're doing. And this might not have been the best day to do this, but I promise I will cut any other ones out, but funny that that <laughs> went by. While I was telling you about why it's a bad idea to be doing any sort of audio recording today in my house. But anyway, the Closet Core Carolyn Pajamas. They're your sort of classic fancy pajama set with the uh, notched collar, optional piping, sleeve cuffs, cuffs on the shorts or the pants. And as I think I outlined in a previous video, I wanted to make some out of uh, Liberty Tan Alon uh, to bring on vacation when I go uh, not that long from now, to be honest. My mom and I are going on vacation to India, and as we'll be sharing a room, I thought I should probably wear nice pajamas instead of <laughs> ratty old t-shirts with armpit holes. <laughs> and so I made them. So yes, this is Liberty Lawn or Liberty Tanalon. I know Liberty is known for their florals. Excuse me, no. We do not lie. On the freshly sewn Liberty PJs. I can go there, sir. Um, but yeah, so Liberty is known for their florals. And if you just showed me this in a shop, I would like it, but I might not have known it was Liberty. Or, but I bought this in Liberty of London, one of the last times I was in London, and I just thought it was really fascinating, even though it is, a geometric pattern is not Liberty's thing. But I bought... Ooh, how much did I buy? 
this is where I pull up a uh, stash, what is it called, stash hub, will tell me how much I bought because I did put all this in there. So I bought three meters at the time. I think I was going to make a dress out of it, but then I decided it would make perfect PJs. So as I said, the Closet Core Caroline pajamas. These are the shorts, obviously. Uh, you can also make uh, full length pants. I did piping uh, on the bottom cuffs and on the side. Uh, the white piping, it's actually slightly off-white. It was um, one of the extra whites from my birdling quilt. I wanted white for the borders and couldn't decide online which, uh, which would work better. And then once I finished the quilt, or once I chose which one I wanted to use for that, I turned this um, into piping. I pre-washed it, I had a meter, and then I cut about half of that meter into bias strips, sewed them all together, and used them throughout this project. And considering that I just sort of eyeballed it and thought that's probably enough as I was cutting out my bias strips, I had almost the perfect amount. I just had a few little scrappy bits left over, which was really nice. So these are the shorts. This is the top. This is what stopped me sewing for so long. I made the size 12 in the shirt, and I believe the shorts were size 12 as well. I have made the pattern before. I have these. These are very old. These are flannel. And I love this fabric, which I believe was just from, this was just from Fabricland in Calgary at some point. Um, because it's got a plaid pattern, but then also these bright neon roses all over it. Loved this. And this is satin piping uh, from Fabricland as well. Made these so long ago. I could not even find the pattern pieces from when I printed these out and pieced the, pieced the PDF together. I have no idea what size this is. And like, I assumed until this morning when I pulled these out so I could show them to you, I'd assumed they would not fit me anymore because I haven't worn them in a while. My apartment's really hot even in the winter, so flannel pajamas don't actually get much use because <laughs> it's boiling anyway, but they fit. And like, I made these, has to be at least seven or eight years ago. And I am a different size, so maybe I just made them extra large? I don't know. So yeah, I've made this before. I also cut the top out of this flannel fabric, and I had a lot more of the satin piping to do the top. It sat in my work in, works in progress bin in pieces for so long. I made these before I moved, and I moved seven years ago. And so I moved with the top pieces cut, and they lived here for a long time. And I eventually, I just had to like cleanse it from my to-do list and I threw it all out because I knew I wasn't going to do it. It had been so long, any markings I'd put on the fabric pieces had disappeared. I didn't know what size it was. <laughs> These are 12, which is my measurements. When I put them on though, I mean considering they're meant to be comfy for sleeping, I could have made the next size up. But if I made these again, I would make the next size up and then just make sure the elastic was the right size for my waist. And then that just gives you a bit more like movement room. They're not gonna be impossible to wear. I'm still gonna wear them, but they are a little tight over like the fullest part of my hips and... And then the pajama top and the collar that just made me not want to do anything. <laughs> So when putting this together, this part of the collar is sewn fairly soon, so because I wanted to put a label in there, I had to pick it quite early in the process. And maybe this is what damned me, but it says my best work yet. It is not my best work yet. There was a lot of fudging. Um, by the time I realized I just needed to work on this and get it done and get it off the table and off my obligation list. So yeah, there's a lot of little bits where I could have... Like, don't get me wrong, I unpicked a lot of stuff and redid it, but there are some other bits where I did it, looked at it, and thought, I could unpick that and make it better, but I'm not gonna. The actual quality of the garment is not my best work yet, but finishing it, I'm very proud of that, and for that I think I'm allowed to uh, keep the my best work yet tag. So again, I've got this. Actually, I think I called this piping earlier. I mean, it is piping. It doesn't have a uh, cord in it, so I just cut bias strips and then ironed them in half. So this is just flat piping on this one on the sleeve cuffs and all around the collar and the front and a little bit on the pocket, which is really the only thing that makes it so you can see this pocket just because of the, the craziness of the pattern. I didn't bother doing any pattern matching or anything because the repeat 
It was hard to find a repeat in this pattern, and when I did it was very big, and I had a fair chunk left over that I might do some other stuff out of. You can barely, you can barely even see the pocket. It's the white that gives it away, so that didn't really need to be matched. So for the shirt, I made the size 12, which is 38 inch um, full bust, 31 waist, 40 inch hip. And that makes sense that this shirt feels too big on me. <laughs> I think I sized up, well I sized up because that is my hip measurement. And so I knew the top um, where it hits on the models, it sort of slightly covers the hips. So I knew that I, it needed to be at least that wide at the bottom to fit over my hips. Um, I'm not a 38 inch bust. I'm a, couple inches uh, smaller than that, which makes sense when I put this on. It, feel, it does feel big in the top and even a little bit in the waist, but it's PJs. And that's why I didn't bother doing any fancy grading or anything at the time when I was cutting it out and like having the 12 on the bottom and then the 10 on the top or whatever. It's PJs. You want it to be loose and comfy. So, I mean, it still fits. It's not like unwearably huge or anything because it's only a couple inches difference but it's definitely slightly oversized. I took some photos just now as well of me wearing both pieces together. Um, and the shirt, although I knew that it would like need to have that, need to be as wide as my hip because it would come down that far, came down a, like it's a lot longer than I thought. I am five foot three. I'm not certain what height uh, Closet Core drafts their patterns for, but that sort of thing is usually at least five six. So at least three inches taller than I am. And so when I took the photos of the shorts, which are just the regular shorts length, even though I know I'm short, I didn't want to take any length out of that because I just didn't want them, I didn't want them to be shorty shorts. <laughs> but even though those are the regular length shorts and this is the regular length shirt, just with my body proportions, the shirt almost entirely covers the shorts that I'm wearing it. And it also, again, because of this crazy pattern, it all blends in together, it all blends into itself. I really love it. I love, I mean, it's Liberty Lawn, so it's so soft and silky, which is really nice. I did find as I was sewing, I was doing a lot of pressing, because I've made, I made a sagebrush top out of a different pattern, Liberty Lawn, out of the one with all the animals. And when I, like, I've worn that to work a bunch of times, and then I've washed it a bunch of times, and I don't often have to iron it. Like sometimes just have to iron down the ruffle across the front because it's sticking out. But I don't feel like it like it gets wrinkly as you wear. This was getting wrinkly like as I was working on it because I ironed it before I cut out all the pieces. Everything I picked up to sew was just full of wrinkles. On this inner facing here, so like this is the outside of the shirt and then there's this facing on the inside. Um, you interface the facing part and like, so I had this, these two long skinny pieces with the little like jut out for the collar here that had been cut out of iron fabric when I cut them out. I ironed them again before I attached, before I fused the facing, or before I fused the interfacing. After I fused the interfacing, like every wrinkle was now stuck <laughs> into the into the interfacing. So I, I made those wrinkles permanent by doing that with the facing. I did have leftover fabric. I could have cut it again, but I wanted, I figured, oh, it's just the facing. It'll be on the inside. You won't really notice it. This is mostly true because the facing runs the whole length of the button band on both sides. But as you can tell, like this is the outside of the shirt. But then of course your collar is open like that. So this little section of the facing shows. And I have managed to press it over and over and over basically every time I go to the iron. I have managed to press it and I've been slowly getting out some of those wrinkles, but yeah, I just don't know why this one seems so much more wrinkly, or at least much more wrinkly than I remember when making um, that sagebrush top. So yeah, the fiddly bit on this was definitely the collar. The instructions were good. Uh, there's also some pictures on the blog, but on Closet, Cor Closet Core's blog, but uh, they are older because this is an older pattern. And I think if they, redid some of those photos according to like the standards they have now or the like photo quality they do now I think it would be clearer because uh, some of the the fabric choice I found was fairly dark uh, to show off something and not like those photos weren't too much clearer to me than the drawings and so it all worked out in the end there was one spot where I did mistake in the pattern instructions when you're sewing this part of the collar so this like the back of your neck part and like the, this part of the collar, because this only has this, it doesn't have the notched part, like the notched lapel here or anything. There was one part in there where I mistook what was a stay stitching line of stitching in the illustration for an actual line of stitching. 
So I made this whole collar piece and then sewed almost all the way around it, apart from this center bit, which they tell you sort of to notch and iron up, etc. These other ends are meant to be free still, but as I said, I mistook the stay stitching for actual stitching, and so I sewed all the way around it, um, turned it right side out, trimmed my seam allowances, then turned it right side out and ironed it, and then it was at that point was sort of where I stalled out. Then that collar piece was sitting on the table, and I remember being in the shower a couple days later, where you always have your best thoughts in the shower, thinking, how am I meant to attach the rest of that collar to the shirt if those two bits are sewn up? Shouldn't those bits be open? Because then how, how does it attach? And then I watched the TV show and didn't think about it for a while, and then when I got back to it, I looked at the illustrations properly and I thought about it, and I thought, no, this seam has to be open because you have to, like, stick this bit in there. And then I realized my mistake and I had to unpick. And then that made... And again, I didn't... I should have. But I didn't cut out another collar and start again. I used the one I had. I hadn't trimmed the seam allowances that badly. That meant I couldn't use it anymore after unpicking, but it did make lining everything up to get this nice notch a little bit of a pain, just because like not all my seam allowances were the same length anymore, and I had to account for that and make sure everything was caught where it should be, etc, etc. It's fine. You see, here's one of the bits I could have unpicked but didn't. That might be too small for the camera to pick up, but you top stitch around and I don't remember why, but I was doing it from the back, so it makes sense on the back, but here my navy blue top stitching crosses the white piping, but I didn't care enough about that particular piece to unpick and do again. <laughs> yeah, the back is pretty normal. Oh, the insides. Let's show the insides. So I don't have a serger or anything, and I wanted these to be nice inside, and like the Liberty Lawn is delicate. I didn't really want it to fray. So where I could, I did French seams. So like my big side seam, French seam, shoulders, French seam. I know I could have French seam, French seamed in the sleeves, especially because according to the pattern, you put these in flat. So you haven't sewn up the side seams yet when you put the sleeves in, but I didn't want to. <laughs> that got a little confusing. And with such curves like you have around um, a shoulder and an armhole, uh, it didn't seem practical to do it that way, so I just sewed it normally, then I did a zigzag, and then I trimmed off the extra with my pinking shears. And that sort of finish has worked for me many times before on this sort of fabric. Everything else is pretty much nicely enclosed. As I said, now you can see the inside facing inside. You can see that like bubbly, wrinkly texture sort of here too. Again, this is the inside of the facing. As I said, I'm just so happy that I finally finished this project and that this pajama top did not <laughs> defeat me like the last one did, like the flannel one did. Um, this morning I sewed the buttons and the buttonholes. You need five buttons for this, and I was going through my button stash. I found five perfect uh, blue buttons with just like a little, a little marble of a lighter blue. And so I, th I thought that went really well because they're sort of navy blue with a, a lighter blue blotch fun. I tried, as I was sewing the buttons on, I tried to put the little pale blue blotch going a different direction each time. Like some are up, some are down, left, right. Um, uh, I got the buttons through the buttonholes, which is always... somehow I always make that into a problem for myself, because I don't want the buttonholes to be too big, so I make them the smallest they possibly can be. I do tests. I put the buttonhole through the test. The problem is I'm always so worried about my buttonholes fraying that I cover everything in fray check which sort of stops the fabric fraying and the stitching coming undone once you've cut it open. And I think that, I mean, that makes it less elastic, because there is a little bit of give before that, like, I don't know, essentially plastic goo um, is put on there. So, and I don't do that, I should, but I don't do that to the test buttonhole, so it went through the regular buttonhole fine, because there's a little stretch in there. And then once it's free checked so it's safe and will last, it's a little bit of work to get those buttons through. But luckily, I don't need, because of the v-neck, I don't need to undo the buttons ever again. <laughs> so I guess I could have just sewed, actually sewed the whole thing shut and not had buttonholes at all, just had the buttons. Sew the buttons on there so it looks like it buttons up like a razor shirt. But that's fine. I just don't need to... I don't need to ever undo those buttons again. And it was just sort of perfect um, serendipity that I had the exact number of buttons I needed in just the right color. 
I knew I had some white buttons in various sizes that would work um, that I thought I might use if I couldn't find anything the right shade of blue just to like they would pop a bit more and they would highlight the white trim but I like the blue ones and yeah these are my vacation PJs we will be gone for two weeks and I'm not certain what the laundry situation will be like I could wash wash things in the sink but then hopefully these it would need to dry like I would obviously I'd wear the pajamas to bed wash them early in the morning go out and do stuff during the day and hope they're dry by the time I come back the other thing I'm thinking is I have enough leftovers of this fabric I could do like a second not this type of shirt but just like a boxy t-shirt I could, I'm sure I could get one of those out of the same fabric and so I'd have a second option for top to wear to bed because two weeks gotta wash your PJs in there sometime <laughs> and it would be easier if I had like spares so I could hang this up in the bathroom and it could dry for a couple days rather than just like 12 hours between me getting up and going back to bed again so I'm I'm wondering about that I may just have to bring another pair of sleep shorts or PJ pants or something because I don't think I could get another pair of shorts out of what I have left over if I do the boxy top. The other thing is if I pick that top pattern right, and I'm just thinking like simple boxy tee, I could wear it for PJs. Or after the vacation, I could wear it out. I almost feel like I could wear this guy out. Like it has sort of, I don't know, like crazy bowling shirt vibes to it. So thank you so much for watching this video and waiting while I unintentionally took August off. Uh, it's so great to be back and sewing and it is such a relief off my mind to have this thing done. I can do any of the 17 other things I want to do now <laughs> without feeling bad that this is sitting there half done. I'm really excited about that. Let me know, do you ever is there one project that ever gives you a block like that? Like, what do you do in that situation? Because as I said, in the past, I've tossed things out just because I couldn't deal with it being unfinished anymore. But this, I, I knew I wanted this shirt so badly. I just eventually, after a few weeks of staring at it, powered through and did it to the best that I could, the best that I cared about. But what do you do in that situation? Do you, do you trash it? Do you do it? Do you put it in a box and think about it next year? <laughs> because I've also done that. <laughs> I have also used that coping strategy. So I hope everyone has a great day or evening, whatever time of day it is, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay, so just a tiny little Good Omens side story. This is my copy of Good Omens. I I think the book came out in 99-ish. Oh no, I was wrong. The book came out in 1990. I did not buy it then, but I think I, I must have bought this somewhere around, I don't know, sometime between 2001 and 2005-ish, because in 2005 I worked at a bookstore in my hometown and Neil Gaiman was coming to do a signing, or to do a reading and signing, and he was obviously too big a star to be like in the bookshop like we did sometimes, or like in the one of the hallways of the mall that the bookshop was in, and so he was doing this reading and signing at a whole different venue in a theater and I had been newly hired by the bookshop. I'd always wanted to work there. Finally got hired in my last year of university. And because I was one of the newest hires with the least seniority, I had to be in the bookshop while Neil Gaiman was speaking. My coworkers were running an event somewhere else. Very sad. I think that, I think that was for a Nancy Boys. I think it was that one. That was his newest uh, book. But the bookshop let us Bowen Books in Victoria, BC. Great independent bookstore. Um, so those of us who couldn't attend the event or had, for whatever reason had to be in the bookshop, like a bunch of us had to run it, we were allowed to send uh, books to be signed by Neil Gaiman during the event um, in like a big staff box of books. So we sort of posted everything so that you knew this was mine and he knew it was to be signed to Heather. I realize now we were probably just supposed to be doing that with that new release. <laughs> so I realize now I probably should have not sent along a paperback of an old issue of an old book of his, but he signed it anyway. And so we have Heather, we made the devil do it. And this is something, this is a possession I love very, very much. And it has been on my bookcase for 20-ish years now. I always really wanted to get Terry Pratchett to sign it as well because 
If I'm honest, I have owned and I have read way more Terry Pratchett books than I've read Neil Gaiman. I love Terry Pratchett's uh, Discworld series, and I definitely read tons of those before I picked this one up. And at the time, picked it up because Terry Pratchett was involved and I had heard of Neil Gaiman. And then I loved this and have read a few more Neil Gaiman, a few more of Neil Gaiman's books. But yeah, I never, never got a chance to have Terry Pratchett sign it before he passed away, but that is why the show is so great. Because Neil's involved, he is keeping the Terry parts alive. There's so many good little... See, this is why I'm so obsessed with it. There are so many good little Easter eggs in the show that reference... Like, there's some that reference Discworld and Terry Pratchett, and it's just really, really well done, and I think everyone, watch the show, read the book, that's all I have to say.